right. Are you there, uh, Peter? Yes. I no longer see your face. Uh, Do we want to bring up Peter, Cindy? Uh. Uh. All right, there he is. Okay, great. Uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this week, uh, Peter Rackage, who is a uh, associate professor of applied physics and physics and a member of the uh, Yale Quantum Institute at Yale University. Um, so Peter is a uh, leader in the field of, uh, of Rion, Optomechanics or Brion nonlinear photonics or Brion nonlinear optics, depending on who you speak to. Um, so uh, he uh, basically studies extreme phonon photon interactions inside of uh, nanophotonic systems. And he's uh, sort of at the forefront of using these interactions to create uh, novel devices like Brion lasers, um, amplifiers, and non reciprocal photonic devices. Uh, he's also one of the leaders in the field of, uh, uh, of bulk acoustic wave uh, phononics. So they've been taking uh, basically uh, phononic resonators and operating them at cryogenic temperatures uh, and creating really long lived phononic states, uh, uh, which can be interacted with light fields to create um, uh, novel uh, quantum optical mechanical systems and uh, devices uh, that might be useful as accessories for quantum computers like quantum memories. Um, so uh, Peter uh, received the uh, Packard Fellowship a few years ago, as well as the uh, Young Investor Waiter Gator Award uh, from ONR. Um, he got his PhD from uh, MIT and his BS, I believe, from Purdue, and went on to work for four years at Sandia uh, Labs before he got his position at Yale. Um, is all around really a wonderful guy to talk to. I, I uh, fortunately couldn't be here today, but it's quite fortunate that uh, uh, he was able to come for this virtual conference. Um, just a little bit about the format here. This is our first time with the hybrid format. Um, um, Peter's gotten the lowdown here. You guys maybe haven't. Um, we have several people in the audience. Looks like 11. We have maybe 30 people here live. Um, you can interrupt, that's fine. Peter may not be able to hear you, so I'm gonna run over to you if you interrupt and give you this microphone, and then you can interrupt him again. Um, uh, we'll have a regular Q&A at the end, and Peter's also offered to, to take a more informal Q&A uh, after the formal Q&A if you wanna talk about uh, stuff uh, that's not uh, specific to what he talks about uh, today, just like what is it like to work at uh, San Diego Labs? Why did you move from there to academia? So uh, with that, um, I'm really looking forward to what you have to say today, Peter. Um, uh, I'll read the title of your talk, Mixing Light and Sound Using Engineered Brilliant Interactions. Um, the uh, podium is yours. Uh, th thank you very much for this really generous and kind introduction, Dal. And, and, and th thank you to, the, to, to you and to the organizers. Uh, uh, for, for inviting me. It's really, really quite lovely. Uh, um, it, it, it's quite an honor to be, to be, you know, uh, joining you. I, 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 I want to apologize. I, it, one of the, my favorite things about engaging with and being a part of the scientific community is, is really getting to know people um, and, and sharing ideas 
collaborating, learning from each other. And so I, I regret that I'm not actually there, but hopefully this is some approximation um, and, and I'd love to come some point in the future. Um, but I guess with, with that really lovely introduction to Alec, I guess I'll just, I'll just get to the, to the main topic of the presentation is, um, you know, what I, what I want to tell you about in this, in this talk is um, some different explorations that we've been making uh, in my group and with various friends and collaborators uh, of interactions between light and sound. Um, so uh, I'll tell you about some nanophotonic devices or some microphotonic devices. And, and if I have time, I'll, I'll get to some, some larger devices that are really cold that have some really fun properties. Um, so, but, but before I go anywhere in this talk, the, the very most important thing I could do is acknowledge uh, my team and in particular the, the really bright and hardworking and creative individuals who, who, who's, who are highlighted here in red, who, who did the vast majority of the work that I'm going to be displaying today and telling you about, um, in addition to numerous collaborators and, 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 uh, and researchers who have contributed in, in, in uh, very crucial ways to this research, uh, as well as the crucial contribution made by agencies that have supported this work. Um, so, so first of all, um, you know, what I'm going to be telling you about is a process called stimulated Bruin scattering. Um, uh, and this is a, a nonlinear interaction that, that couples uh, light and sound, permitting information to be transferred uh, between those two domains. Um, and, and why would we want to do that? Um, so before I dig into any, any detailed exploration of devices or physics or applications um, uh, of those devices, I, I'd like to take a step back for a moment and give you one particular context if you're, if you're application minded, which, which I am uh, in many cases. Um, uh, you know, why would we want those phonons? So, so let's step back for a second and, and I'll just make a comment about, you know, the, the world we live in. So we're, we're very data hungry people. Every one of us has something like this in our pocket. And, um, and uh, you know, our cellular, um, our, the, the circuits that are inside of our cell phones and, and we're using, to, to, you know, for everyday life, um, really efficiently talk to microwaves, which are, you know, using cellular towers, what we are, you know, transmitting data from Facebook, your emails, et cetera, um, you know, over these, over this, some, some region in the gigahertz frequency range, um, you know, using. Um, but we also have a fiber optic backbone, you know, we're very proud optics people, for example, um, you know, fiber optics have transformed, uh, you know, our daily lives here. Um, and so you, you may already know that um, by modulating light and transmitting it down an optical fiber, we can, con we can carry tremendous data, data bandwidths that are sort of it's very easy to, to transmit terabits per second of information. Whereas, you know, these sorts of devices, you know, microwave devices and circuits, it's harder to, to, to manipulate such immense bandwidths. But, but we're, we're very data hungry society. Um, and so uh, uh, there are a number of, there's, a, there's an enclave of the photonics community that is exploring the possibility of augmenting the bandwidth of conventional circuitry using a hybrid approach by sort of marrying, um, you know, the, the benefits of photonics in, in our ability to carry very wide, wide band uh, data uh, using using optical waveguides that might be a fiber or a little nanophotonic waveguide. Um, if, if we could sort of combine these two technologies, um, you know, uh, perhaps we could create chips that that manipulate incredibly wideband microwave, uh, you know, signals um, or, or operate at very, very unusual and high frequencies um, using photonic approaches. So uh, there's one thing that I, I will just say, it's going to sound strange, but I'll say it's sort of missing from our toolkit. If we think about um, photonics and photonics, we can make little resonators that it would filter signals. We can modulate. We can do a lot of different things. But one thing that I'll argue is missing um, is acoustic wave signal processing. And that might seem really strange. Um, why, would, why would I say that? Um, and, and, and here's where I'll just give a little bit of background. Um, I, I like to refer to phonons or acoustic waves as sort of the unsung hero of modern communications and timekeeping. 
Um, you may not be aware of this, but inside of your cell phone, we have a number of dedicated chips that use acoustic wave signal processing. Um, uh, you know, acoustic wave that are our acoustic wave signal processors inside of our our cell phone, the channelizers. We also, if if you have an old fashioned wristwatch, this is a little bit new fashion, but if you have an old fashioned wristwatch, you most definitely have a little canister that has literally a tuning fork that is made out of quartz um, that is piezoelectrically actuated. Um, that, that, that is really, so it, it turns out that these sorts of acoustic wave technologies are still really the mainstay for timekeeping and um, none of your routers or our cellular technologies would work without specialized chips that, 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 um, that process uh, microwave signals using piezoelectric coupling to surface acoustic waves and, and different types of acoustic modes. Um, and why, is this, why are these acoustic waves beneficial? The, the reason why um, is because they, sound travels much, much more slowly than light. So it's just easier to hold on to those signals if they, if they travel slowly. Um, and the other thing is that elastic waves uh, are, are the, these excitations can live for a very long time inside of solid state media. Um, so, so we can make things much smaller when the wavelength is, is, is smaller uh, due to the slower sound speed, but also these excitations live for a really long time. So these are the, these are the reasons why the you know, phonons are an integral part of our, of our signal processing technologies uh, today. Um, so, so the question that I want to ask is, uh, you know, what could we do if we, if we could marry, um, you know, if, if we could seamlessly connect um, signals or, or access phonons with light? Okay, so just to give a little bit of context, you know, what I've been describing to you in the previous slide was um, that, that we are using piezoelectricity to readily, we've been doing this for decades, using piezoelectric actuation to couple um, between microwave signals uh, with electrical wires and acoustic wave signals um, in, say, a surface acoustic wave device. Um, we, we're also already, for telecommunications and integrated photonic devices, using modulators and detectors that allow us to convert microwave signals to uh, the optical domain and back again. Okay. Um, and the question that I want to ask in this presentation is, you know, uh, is there a way for us to seamlessly connect um, the photonic signal processing and phononics uh, to access or, or interface these two domains. And, and I'll ask this question through the lens of this process called stimulated Bruin scattering. Okay, so, um, and we'll see that there are a lot of interesting things that can, can be done if we can um, interface these two domains kind of seamlessly and maybe manipulate new, new types of nonlinearity or, or old ones that we're reinventing a bit. Um, and, and we'll see that we can make amplifiers, we can make new type filters like the ones I was talking about um, that are based on acoustics, and we can, um, we, we can make lasers and, and we can engineer non-reciprocal response. So th there are a, a bunch of really interesting things that we can do here. Um, so before I get into any of that, um, let's just start with some basics. Uh, so, so what is stimulated Ruan scattering? Um, if, if you do a Google search for this effect, you'll find a lot of papers on optical fibers, okay? So, um, so, uh, so here I'm showing this sort of a zoom up photograph I took a long time ago of an optical fiber. Um, and in, in the dope, in the germanium, uh, so optical fiber is silica um, strand, uh, that's 125 microns in dimension with a, a germanium doped core that's like 10 microns. And what, what happens, it, it's very interesting, is it turns out just by some coincidence that the germanium doping that, that guides light through total internal reflection also guides sound um, in, in the same structure. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so, so it turns out this simultaneous guidance helps to make what we'll see a, a, this type of acousto-optic or Bruan interaction very strong. And how large is it? Just to give you a little context, Bruon nonlinearities or specifically Bruon gain is larger by, by about a hundred times than any other interaction in a fiber. So it's rather unusual, okay? And that's partly because the phonons live so long in, in, in these interactions. Um, the other thing that's interesting and, and we'll exploit or we'll, we'll do things like this is it turns out that the strength and character of this interaction um, is highly dependent on geometry. So if we bury the dimension of the, of the core or change the geometry of the fiber, we're going to change that Bruon nonlinearity. Um, so, so how does it work? It's not too difficult to understand. If we consider two counterpropagating waves, say, say a wave uh, entering a fiber optic from the left and another entering from, from the right, 
um, these two waves will interfere. And in the bright regions of this interference pattern, it turns out that um, the material, uh, which has photoelastic response, meaning the dielectric constant changes in response to strain, um, because of this, optical forces are generated where in the bright regions of this interference pattern. And this, in turn, produces a grating. In, in this case, uh, if these two waves have a different frequency, this grating is advancing and moving. And when, that, when this, the frequency difference between these two waves exactly matches, um, uh, you know, or, and, or rather, when the frequency separation is chosen such that this fringe pattern advances exactly at the speed of sound, we, have, we, we can resonantly excite a traveling elastic wave that produces a form of dynamical Bragg scattering, meaning it, it, uh, if, if we have an incident pump wave from the left um, and we have a signal wave entering from, uh, uh, from the right, um, it turns out that this signal wave is amplified by this dynamical Bragg scattering at the expense of the pump wave intensity. So, so this is what is called stimulated Bruin scattering. And what I've just described in, in sort of a more physical uh, you know, description is, is phase matching. Um, so, so um, and, and I just want to, for the purposes of this um, presentation, I just want to highlight three aspects of an optical fiber that make this interaction strong. Um, or, or that are necessary for a strong interaction um, so, uh, uh, through SBS. So, so first, we want optical wave guidance. Um, and, and of course, our fiber has that. Uh, the, the, um, we also need photoelastic interactions or optical forces, which in this case are produced by photoelastic response. Um, and we also, in order to make sure that the scattering occurs before the phonons decay or exit the system, we would like them to hang around, which, which therefore it's helpful to have wave guidance. So with these criteria in mind, I want to ask, you know, is it possible to have SBS in nanophotonic wave guides made out of, say, silicon? So, so this is a question that we were asking um, you know, uh, you know, a long time ago, um, I was working on integrated photonics um, at Sandia, Sandia National Labs and, and was wondering, gosh, you know, there's this really interesting and highly tailorable nonlinearity in fibers. Can we possibly create it in, in, a, in an integrated photonic device? And, um, you, know, uh, you know, my expectation was, yes, that it would be, you know, an enormous and highly, you know, a much stronger interaction um, because the core of a, of a nanophotonic waveguide is considerably smaller than the 10 micron dimensions on the core of the core of, of a typical optical fiber. So, you know, my, my expectation was that this would be a very large effect. But in fact, um, what we found is that, you know, we tried to observe it, we couldn't find it. And a lot of other folks have been trying, we, we learned. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, people don't publish their negative results the way they used to. So I learned about it at conferences and, and colloquia. But, um, but in reality, these, these effects are very, very weak in silicon photonics. And, and so why might that be? So that's, that's what I want to tell you about, about next. Um, so there was a mystery about Bruan interactions. And, as, and we didn't observe these effects until 2013, even though nonlinearities had been studied in silicon waveguides for over a decade. Um, and uh, the, the answer comes down, we can understand through, through these, these criteria that I out outlined for making um, large Bruan interactions. So we want optical wave guidance. If, if we consider making a rectangular waveguide of silicon and placing it on top of a silicon dioxide uh, substrate, which is the, the, the basic structure of a lot of silicon photonic waveguides, um, you know, we have this tightly confined mode. And um, so clearly this structure is created with the intention of making optical wave guidance. So we, we have wave guidance of these criteria. Um, the other thing we require are large optical forces. It, the larger the force, the stronger our ability, the, large, the, the greater our ability to transduce these waves and mediate this coupling. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we begin to ask, you know, around 2010, do, does, does, do these wave guides support large forces? And, and in fact, they do. Uh, silicon silicon waveguides produce extraordinarily large forces through not just these photoelastic properties, but through radiation pressure. And this is really intriguing by itself. Um, but, but what I want to get to is why weren't we able to observe these effects in silicon waveguides? Um, and, and the answer boils down to the fact that this silicon um, uh, on insulator structure is a fabulous waveguide for light, but it's a really lousy waveguide for sound. Okay, so, so what, we, what we discovered is when doing simulations and thinking deeply about this effect is that while, while the optical forces can transduce these elastic waves, they radiate away from the waveguide 
rather quickly, about as quickly as they're created. Um, and this is because the waveguide is an anti-guiding, it's, it's, while it's a waveguide for light, it's an anti-guiding system for sound, meaning we have opposite conditions necessary for total internal reflection. We have a, a leaky mode by definition. Um, so, so this was the problem. And in order to solve this problem, what we did was make some proposals. Uh, first, we, we said, hey, gosh, if we could eliminate the substrate pathway for leakage, perhaps we could have a really strong interaction. Um, and so the idea is, let's try to etch away uh, and suspend this waveguide so that we have something that approximates a perfect waveguide for light and for sound. Um, and you know, perhaps we could have some really interesting interactions here um, that, and strong brew anomaly areas. And so this, this structure enables guidance of sound where we didn't have it before. Um, so so um, I'll just summarize a couple of things that we learned when we first started to simulate these, these devices and explore these possibilities. Um, so, so what we learned is that um, while uh, this, this type of a waveguide um, that, that is both a waveguide for light and sound um, that's made out of silicon, while it does support the type of backwards Bruon scattering process that I, that I was describing in the optical fiber, where both of the wave, the, the pump and signal waves are counterpropagating. While, while this can exist inside of these silicon waveguides, we found that they're surprisingly weak. Um, and, and this is because of these unusual tensor properties for the photoelastic response inside of these material, inside of silicon in particular. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, but there's sort of a little movie of um, uh, uh, the motion of this uh, of, of waveguide mode that um, we would excite at these high frequencies using this process. Um, but the, uh, th it, the, the, the surprise of this, of this exploration was that um, we have very strong, the, the possibility for very strong forward Bruon interactions, which are rather unusual and not as well studied um, in the context of fiber optic systems. So through forward Bruon interactions, we have um, uh, we would have a co-propagating pump and signal wave. And these phase matching between these two waves would be uh, satisfied by a rather short um, longitudinal wave vector for sound, which is one that is practically a standing wave. Um, the movie is not showing up, but it, it has a lot of transverse wave motion. And that type of motion is what our, our P11 photoelastic coefficient, which is very large in silicon, likes to couple to. So, um, so the ob observations that I'd like to sort of use, uh, you know, uh, moving forward is that um, th the key thing that was a surprise to many people is that silicon waveguides are very unusual. The material is unusual in many ways, and uh, and and it turns out that as a result of these unusual material properties, uh, in 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 contrast to the backward Bruon processes everyone is used to studying, forward Bruon interactions offer the greatest potential in, in these waveguides. Um, and, and it turns out that many people were disappointed by this fact because how do I use the thing that I always knew how to use in fiber optics? We've got to be a little more creative to, to make use of this interaction. Um, but, uh, but there is a, a, a real upside if we, if we succeed. And that is that um, no longer do we require circulators and isolators in order to separate counterpropagating waves. If we have a, a signal wave propagating in one direction, a pump propagating the other, we typically would want to collect the amplified signal wave, and that might require a circulator. So, um, OK, so summarizing a lot of things that we learned um, about these, these interactions and the basics of how they work, um, we, we set out to demonstrate um, Bruon the, these nonlinearities in, in some nanophotonic structures when I was at Santia, um, and, and some talented folks and, and colleagues of, of ours at Ghent University got quick to work doing the same. And um, you know, we, we obtained uh, some, some demonstrations saying, hey, we're not crazy. These effects are there. They're large. Um, that's really exciting. We're engineering some new processes, making them strong. Um, uh, and then uh, so, so some folks at Ghent University made somewhat better structures than, than we did, which, was, which is also very exciting. Um, you know, we're climbing up this hill uh, to, to try to make something useful. Um, uh, but what we discovered, what both of us discovered in the end was that using nanophotonic waveguides, which were really very small, turned out not to be the best solution because um, of, of high losses and dimensional sensitivities that are presented by these really small waveguides. And in the end, what we found uh, was, and we developed some structures that we use at Yale um, and have been using for years now, 
um, is, is, a, is a waveguide that looks something like this. And I'll explain how it works in a moment. But, um, but the basic thing that I want to you know, communicate is we'll use structures that look like this to demonstrate high gain amplifiers, to create um, non-reciprocal response, to, to, make, do, to create new signal processing um, you know, uh, uh, devices, and, uh, and, and a, a variety of things that will make a little more sense as we progress, I hope. Um, so OK. So this is the type of structure that I'll, I'll tell you about um, and what, what's involved. So, so the idea is, is not too complicated. What we start out with is a, a, um, a, a layer of crystalline silicon that sits on top of SiO2. Um, and, and this is what we pattern. We pattern this layer um, to produce a ridge that guides light. OK, so this, is, this ridge waveguide guides light through total internal reflection. Um, um, and uh, you know, we could try to use this structure to do you know do our gruon experiments but it would be problematic because the sound waves would leak out too quickly to mediate strong scattering um so instead what we did is um we we, we use the same structure and we punch slots on either side of this optical waveguide so that we have guidance for light and simultaneous guidance for sound okay so this you can think of this as being a conduit for sound because we've etched these slots that Sort of reflect the sound waves and keep them confined here. So, so using this structure, we have guidance of both light and sound, um, and this allows us to get large gruon amplification. And relative to the nanophotonic structures that we were experimenting with and those of our our, our colleagues at Ghent, um, we were able to get uh, achieve uh, you know get above this break even point where gain is equal to loss. And that's what we want to get over to make a laser, to make a useful amplifier. Um, we were able to get over that by a pretty significant margin. And the key to doing this was choosing a waveguide structure that gives us low optical losses. So that makes it easier for us to you know, balance gain and loss and, and get, get above, above that threshold. And the other thing that this helps us do is actually mitigate um, dimension, uh, inhomogeneous broadening of the Bruan gain that's produced by very small nanometer scale dimensional variations. Um, turns out these were sort of non-intuitive from the start, but we learned that, that this needed to happen. And, and this is what allowed us to get, uh, to use these slightly larger waveguides to get really exciting results that I'll, that I'll be building on in the, in the slides to come. So, so here, uh, if we zoom in on this waveguide cross section, so here I'm just showing a, 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 a slice through this waveguide. Um, what, what we have in the core and where the ridge exists, we have this light field that's confined to the center of the structure. And we also are, um, you know, we're producing optical forces that take the following form. They're essentially stretching the waveguide laterally. Um, and that excites elastic waves that look something like this. So they're, they're essentially, we've got three anti-nodes for this extent, this, this um, uh, largely lateral, laterally compressive wave. Um, so, so okay. So this is the these are the, this is the light field. This is the sound field we're coupling to. How do we make use of these interactions? So I'll try to illustrate that um, with uh, a, a slightly different geometry. So using the this structure, we were able to demonstrate amplification. Well, which we'll show you we can use to amplify light. But um, but to just show you some weird and and creative things that we can do to to perform signal processing, trying to marry these Venn diagrams, I'll 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 walk you through us. I'll introduce a slightly different structure. So so the idea is is very similar. We have a waveguide core made that is a ridge, and then we have a conduit for sound formed by these slots. But rather than reflecting the sound using these air slots. What we're going to do uh, is, is switch slightly, the, change slightly the structure, and we're going to use Bragg scattering with a periodic array of holes in order to produce reflection to confine the phonons. So, so the same, we have really the same idea here. Light is guided in this ridge in the center, um, and the sound field explores a slightly larger area. Now we, it is, we are producing reflection and confinement through Bragg reflection. Um, so these, this periodic periodicity is, is satisfying the Bragg condition for the sound waves. So what's interesting about this, this um, device, this, this um, device that uses a phononic crystal or this periodic structure, um, is that it'll, it gives us some additional freedom to do some interesting things with, with respect to signal processing. So, um, so what, what, what do I mean by that? Well, well I, I just want to walk you through uh, another aspect of Bruan scattering that's kind of fun. Um, if we 
uh, say were to think of launching a, a pump wave and, and say a weak signal wave into our waveguide um, of the type I was sketching uh, on the previous slide, at the output, uh, when we're resonant for the Bruon condition, when we phase match, when we satisfied phase masking conditions, um, this the, the signal wave will become amplified at the expense of the pump wave, so depleting the pump a little bit. Um, but and, and, and it's important to note that every time we have the stimulated emission of uh, these red signal or Stokes photons, we will also have phonons being emitted. And these phonons you can think of as being sort of um, a mirror image of the signal wave, or they you can think of this uh, of, of them as being a replica of of having a replica of the information encoded on the signal wave. Um, and and if, if you're familiar with microwave systems, you can think of this as being like a mixer, a mixer that, that mixes signals between optical and acoustic domain. Um, so, and what happens is this replica of the signal is emitted as an elastic wave. And because of the phase matching conditions, these phonons that are being emitted and passing through this Bragg mirror uh, with partial reflectivity are actually radiated laterally to the structure. Um, almost perpendicular, not quite, but very close. Um, so, uh, so, so this is an intriguing thing, and it sort of points to the fact that we can actually transduce signals from optical to acoustic domain, and we'll see that we can actually detect them as well using, using um, a, a structure that we like to call a, the, the, an emitter-receiver. So here we have actually coupled two such waveguides um, that, that have a phononic crystal cladding. So this phononic crystal superstructure we have embedded within it two waveguides. One we call the emitter, um, where we are one we are. This is the waveguide we're using to transduce these elastic waves, and we have a receiver waveguide on the right. So, so how does this work, and what do we obtain when we when we put this system together? So, what I want you to consider is, you know, injecting a pump and signal wave into the left waveguide. These two, um, the signal wave is amplified, and the process phonons are emitted. And, and a, a really a replica of the signal wave is generated. Um, and this adjacent waveguide that is acoustically coupled to this partially reflecting acoustic mirror in the center um, uh, is, is now um, talking to the adjacent waveguide through the phononic domain. Um, and this you know, produces sidebands uh, or phase modulates the light field that's propagating in, in the right, right channel of this, of this system. Um, and if we look at, if we measure the response that's produced as signals are going from the optical domain to the acoustic domain and back, what we obtain, obtain is something rather unusual, rather remarkable, actually. Um, we've, we've created by coupling these two waveguides and, and combining their, the, you know, and coupling these two acoustic resonances supported by each of them is essentially an incredibly sharp two-pole filter response. So this is a very desirable response in the context of signal processing um, that has a much faster roll off than a single Lorentzian can produce. Um, so, and, and, and it has a line width that is, you know, this is a two pole filter with a three megahertz line width. And, and that's, that's, that's pretty remarkable, especially given it the, the, the speed of the roll off. This is very useful in the context of signal processing. And just to put a little bit of perspective. So I, I said earlier, what we're missing from this toolkit for um, signal processing and in, in, in this combined hybrid signal processing approach using uh, photonics to process microwave signals, what we're missing was phono phonons, the ability to talk to phonons. And, um, and so, so what is special about this, this response relative to an optical response that we, could, we a response we could create by all optical means? Um, just to put this in perspective, in order to create a response that has a similar sharpness and and um, uh, you know, overall shape, we would need two optical resonators with Q factors of 100 million, and we need to couple them very precisely in order to produce a, a response of this shape. So, so basically, this is this is at, at this moment in time impossible to do in silicon photonics by any other means. Maybe there's some more exotic waveguides we could use, um, you know, uh, but uh, but they would be rather large by comparison. So, and they're not integrable in silicon, which is really where a lot of um, the, the utility of silicon pho of integrated photonics comes from is the manufacturability. Okay, so, um, so, uh, so here I, I've sort of, hopefully I've given you some idea of the kinds of things we can start to do if we, if we understand and, and have some mastery of these 
of this sort of um, hybrid interactions involving phonons and photons. Um, I've sort of, you know, so this emitter receiver device allows us to create new types of response that we could filter signals with, with you know, uh, in a way that, that would be very difficult to do all optically. Um, and sort of we're combining these Venn diagrams uh, in order to, you know, to, to demonstrate something uh, that that is uh, better that is better than 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 the sum of its parts in a way. Um, at least that's our objective. So um, so so what I what I'll tell you about next, uh, I'll, I'll just say that if you want to learn more about this our signal processing adventures using this this interaction and and um, how this is progressing, I encourage you to take a look at. Uh, the papers by Eric Kittelaus and Shai Gertler. There's a, a few few nice ones that have come out recently. They've done a great job. Um, and uh, so, what, what I'll I'll shift gears and, and tell you about next is um, how we've been able to use a different type of Bruon interaction that I'll tell you about in order to uh, create uh, non-reciprocal interactions and and lasers and amplifiers. So, um, so so first of all. Um, uh, uh, so what, what, I'll, what I'll tell you about in this, in this next part of the presentation is um, a, a new type of process or a different type of process um, that involves two spatial modes. So we're going to use um, acoustic waves and we're going to consider nonlinear interactions that couple different spatial modes in an optical waveguide. Um, this is called sometimes called an intermodal scattering or interband scattering. If you look in the literature, this is more frequently what you'll find. Uh, and, but before I, I I, I emphasize any aspects of non-reciprocity. So, so this non-reciprocity, of course, is, is what we rely on for to make an isolator or circulator um, using magneto-optic materials. Um, so before I, 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 I go any further, I realize I should mention something about non-reciprocity and its importance um, to the field of integrated photonics. Um, at this current moment, I, I should emphasize that um, we, you know, it, it, it turns out to be very difficult to translate um, magneto optic properties or and device technologies uh, into you know very small integrated photonic systems, partly from practical perspective because it's, it's difficult to imagine making a, a, a you know practical manufacturing process that involves these materials and combines them with silicon photonics. But the other reason is um, that uh, it's uh, these magneto optic devices don't translate nearly as well. Uh, in an integrated waveguide setting, um, because they they tend to induce loss when we get to high enough doping densities to to make these uh, non-reciprocal devices, uh, you know, cover a wide bandwidth, for example. So so there's there's a, a large hunt right now in the field of integrated photonics to find solutions. How do we how do we create these essential devices and functionalities without magneto optics? So we'll see that one possible avenue for doing this is going to come from uh, scattering processes that I'll describe. So, so back to the, the topic at hand, how does this intermodal or interband scattering work? Um, so what we're going to consider is a waveguide that supports uh, two spatial modes. Uh, we'll, we'll consider a symmetric and asymmetric spatial mode supported by some waveguide. Um, and, and we have two different dispersion curves associated with each mode. So, um, so let's assume that light is propagating in the fundamental mode and suppose that there exists an elastic wave that mediates coupling between this fundamental spatial mode and, and this, this anti-symmetric spatial mode. So if that phonon exists by definition, there also exists a stimulated scattering process that mediates the, the coupling. If there exists a linear coupling process, there's also a nonlinear coupling process uh, is, is another way of saying that. So, um, so naturally, the displacement and the strain produced when the, you know by this elastic field has to have appropriate symmetry to couple these two modes. So you might imagine that to couple a symmetric and anti-symmetric mode, we've got to have an anti-symmetric dis disturbance in the waveguide. Um, and and we also need, uh, of course, uh, because we're doing optics, we have to have phase matching. So uh, that means we have uh, that that means the initial and final states of this system have to be connected by a phonon whose um, wave vector and frequency uh, differences match up with two points on this dispersion curve. So that's, that's how we summarize this uh, phase matching in this context. Um, so, so there's an intriguing property of this type of scattering, this interband scattering. Um, you know, 
we, we saw that uh, scattering is, is hap it can happen, can occur but from this elastic wave in the forward direction, but can it occur if we were to launch the same fundamental mode in the opposite direction? And it just so happens if we, if we try to line this arrow up um, you know, to, to uh, a waveguide mode that's propagating in, in the minus k direction, in the minus c direction, um, it, it does not connect the same the, the two states in the same way that it did over here. So this tells us that we actually have a non-reciprocal process. So, so if, if this elastic wave is present, um, uh, a, 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 an optical mode will scatter from symmetric to anti-symmetric mode, whereas in the backward direction, this phase matching diagram is telling us that it does not scatter um, in the same way. It's not affected by this phonon in the same way when we consider right mover and left mover. Okay. So, and, and that's the basis for a number of really exciting and interesting proposals um, by, by Shenhui Fan's group, uh, Chris Poulton and, and Phil Russell's group. Um, so, uh, and, and what we've done over the past few years is develop devices that support this interaction. And in order to interface with the different modes of this waveguide, what we, we created, uh, you know, replicating some really clever designs by other folks is a mode multiplexer. So the idea is that for, for, the, for the purpose of this presentation, it's a black box. We inject light into port one and it maps it to the symmetric mode. Inject light into port two, it maps it to the anti-symmetric mode. And if we are, um, we are phase matched to produce uh, resonant Bruin scattering, um, this bright pump field will produce amplification for a weak signal field, um, making it much larger when it comes out of port two. Um, so this is what we see when we when we fabricate a waveguide that looks strikingly similar to the one that I've shown you before, but we're just with a mode multiplexer, um, what we see is as we sweep this signal wave through Bruon resonance condition, um, is we see this nice sharp resonance um, that, that uh, you know grows as we increase the amount of pump power. So increasing the pump power from left to right to 88 milliwatts, we we get three and a half dB of on-off gain, about two and a half dB of net gain, um, gain exceeding loss, um, which, which is adequate to make an amplifier, a laser, and we'll see a number of different things. Um, the, the other thing I'll mention that we'll, we'll make use of uh, in, in a little bit is that if we insert the pump uh, and, and signal wave, uh, and both of them are, are right moving waves, um, uh, we, we, this signal wave receives amplification. However, if we have a right moving pump and a left moving signal wave, the signal wave does not receive amplification. So this is, this is a unidirectional amplifier and that also can give rise to non-reciprocity, which is, which is uh, you know, in this case, we'll see yield some interesting results. Um, so, uh, so the thing that I, I, I will use uh, for uh, in just a moment, um, what, what I'm going to do is just assume that we have uh, as a source of phonons, we'll be using one of these waveguides. So, so what we do is we, we take the same waveguide I've, I've sketched out in the previous um, slide. Uh, we put in a pump wave and a signal wave. We tune the signal wave to the Bruin condition and, and we, we generate a bunch of phonons and we leave it there. We leave the, the pump and signal waves on Bruin resonance. So in this way, we're able to generate a transducer for phonons. Um, and, and what we do is um, put these, both of these waveguides on, the wave, uh, on the same suspended structure so that now we have a phonon emitter. So we're generating, we're generating phonons um, with light and we're using those phonons to source a linear scattering process in an adjacent waveguide so that we can explore these non-reciprocal interband scattering processes. So for the, for the, for the next couple of slides, just know that this waveguide exists and it's being used to, to generate phonons, but um, you know, but for the moment, we'll sort of treat it like the hand of God. The, uh, these phonons are being created, and we're using them to mediate a linear scattering process in an adjacent system. So, so if we, we assume that th these phonons are present, and we launch light into our fundamental waveguide mode, uh, this, this phonon will scatter us into the anti-symmetric mode so that we come out of port two of this mode multiplexer. Um, and uh, you know, if we were to inject that same signal wave uh, into port two of the system, uh, you know, what we find is that the system becomes transparent. Okay, so it does not uh, it, the scattering do, does not occur because this is not a phase matched interaction in the opposite direction. Um, so 
uh, so what we find, uh, you know, when we do our homework and, and work through the response of this system is that we actually have um, uh, uh, efficient scattering, efficient acousto-optic scattering in, from port one, uh, from port one to port two, um, when we uh, at a certain set of frequencies, the same phonon when it, this phonon field is present, it turns out the backward wave will scatter eventually, but at a different set of frequencies. It turns out that at a slightly different set of wavelengths that are about a nanometer apart, we have we we can produce efficient scattering. But uh, but we but over the band of interest, which is about one nanometer, we have high contrast um, non-reciprocal process we can exploit through this inner band scattering process. Uh, and through experiments, this is what we see. So we see something is actually quite close to to these um, to these results. And and just summarizing some of our some some results by Eric Kittelhaus, um, we observed a nice large non-reciprocal contrast with um, 100 gigahertz of bandwidth, which doesn't seem like a lot compared to your Thor Labs isolators that we can buy. But um, but but this is really quite quite tremendous um, compared to what has been demonstrated. Um, using other uh, interactions in integrated photonics. Um, so I'll just mention that uh, a, a former student of the group who graduated recently has really been carrying this uh, forward and doing a really excellent job. In, in reality, we probably don't want to transduce these phonons up here using light. That uh, Photons are really expensive from an energy point of view. It's much more efficient to, do, to transduce these elastic waves using um, a piezoelectric transducer. And that's precisely what Eric has done and, and demonstrated that there's a really promising path towards making these isolators in, in a slightly more integrable form. Um, so the other thing I'll touch on um, uh, is, is you know, our ability to create amplifiers and lasers using this interaction. And I'll walk you through how we do that. I mean, so, so we can use this net amplification theory clearly to make an amplifier. Um, maybe we don't have a lot of net amplification. We'd love to have 30 dB. Um, this is what you're getting out of an erbium fiber amplifier if you're using those in the lab. Um, and, and we'd like to be able to produce that on a chip. We'll see that it's possible to, to use this device to create that high level of gain. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll do that by, st we'll start out by, I'll start out by showing you how we can make a laser, okay? Um, so, so, uh, so basically what we'll do is take this Bruon active waveguide, wrap it into a loop, uh, and I'll, I'll explain how that, how that laser uh, works. So, so the idea isn't too complicated. Um, so what we do is, is essentially make a loop out of our waveguide and imagine that these two regions are suspended waveguide segments that are Bruon active, meaning they support guidance of both light and sound. Um, and what we'll do is um, inject a, a blue pump wave into this system and we'll tune the laser until we resonantly excite the anti-symmetric spatial mode um, such that it circulates uh, and builds up within this resonator. Um, so if we keep turning up that pump wave, uh, at some point we will have enough power uh, to, to exceed su such that we, um, we have a, a round trip gain that matches the round trip loss. And when we, when we reach that point, um, it turns out that we will have a uh, buildup of a spontaneous Stokes wave uh, as it circulates. Uh, we, of course, are producing laser oscillation here. And this Stokes wave, when, when it uh, you know, self oscillates, it, it's, it emits, it gets um, couples out of the system through the same port. Uh, we, we've, over you know, the past few years, demonstrated um, various types of lasers of this form, shown that you, we have this characteristic kink uh, in, in the LL curves that indicate this really abrupt transition to laser oscillation. Um, and we can verify that that's the case by looking, analyzing the coherence properties of the emitted um, spectra. And, and we see that we have you know, many orders of magnitude compression of the spontaneous Bruon line with to, uh, which coincides with, you know, this is consistent with classic laser, laser physics. So shallow towns line narrowing. Um, so, so this, this was a laser, this is, that's a lot of, you know, this is the first, this was exciting to us because it was the first silicon Bruon laser. We went from a process that didn't really exist in silicon, making it very large and then making lasers out of it, engineering it in fun ways. And that, that's really fun. Um, and, and it has some real potential utility, I, 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 uh, but I, 
I'll, I won't go into um, the subtleties of this, the way this laser behaves and, and some of the things you can do with it. Um, the, the thing that I, I wanna sort of walk you through is how we can use the same system essentially to create a high gain amplifier. Um, uh, so, so it turns out um, in order to make an amplifier, if you, if you have a laser, I don't know, for those of you who were doing optics work in, in your lab um, and you wanna, you wanna amplify something, there's, there's a trick that some old laser jocks might know and be able to tell you is that if you have a laser, you've also, you're also very close to cr creating a very high gain amplifier. Um, so we can actually use the same structure to produce resonantly enhanced gain. And um, uh, so, so the idea isn't too, too complicated. Imagine just taking the laser structure that we had before. Um, we inject a pump wave that produces gain a signal wave, in this case, that we'd like to amplify um, into this system. And we also put, uh, we, we also introduce an additional output coupling port that selectively, um, uh, you know, permits um, the, the light from the symmetric mode or from the signal wave to exit the system. Um, well, it turns out that if we operate this, this, what would otherwise be a laser just below threshold, you can produce resonant, um, resonant amplification and yield almost arbitrary magnitude of gain um, uh, at the expense of stability. Um, so, so, uh, so here we're just illustrating this effect, um, you know, using this resonant, uh, turning this Bruin laser into an amplifier by operating it below threshold. We see that we have an on-off gain of 30 dB. So we've taken a system that had a waveguide that only supported a couple of dB of gain, and we've turned that into 30 dB. Um, and, and this corresponds to 20 dB of net amplification, um, uh, which, which is you know, just a nice demonstration of these concepts that probably many of your uh, faculty advisors can tell you about. Um, so, so the other thing that, that, that is intriguing about this system is um, because we have unidirectional gain, because there's only phase matching when, when light is circulating in the, in, the, uh, in the clockwise direction, but not when light is circulating in the counterclockwise direction, um, in, in one direction, um, in the forward direction uh, of operation, the signal sees, you know, 30 dB of gain. In the backward direction, it sees no gain. So this is a, already a very high contrast non-reciprocal system, um, which is of interest for, you know, potentially of interest and, and potential applicability if we're trying to achieve to, to achieve non-reciprocity in integrated systems. Um, so, so I, I, I think I've I, I'm coming close to the time limit here, so I'll wrap up. Um, so, so I've shown you that you know we, we can have some fun, engineer these interactions to create um, you know uh, large amplification uh, that's sort of on par with an urban amplifier, although a much narrower bandwidth. Um, we can also use a similar system uh, and and uh, you, you do something called injection locking. This this offers another way of of creating. Um, uh, tunable oscillators and and of amplifying signals. Um, so ba basically, if we if we turn if we if we uh, were to take the same system, turn the pump power up such that it becomes it begins to self oscillate, and then we inject a small seed wave into uh, into the system, th it will actually um, uh, synchronize with the, it will the seed wave will synchronize uh, will will dictate or govern the frequency of oscillation and yield a large amount of amplification. So there's some other fun things that we can do with this effect. And the last thing I'll just mention that, that is I think perhaps one of the most fun conceptually is um, we can actually use this, this scattering process to, to implement um, cooling of, of modes. So, so you, you may be aware that Raman processes, um, uh, it, it for, through a Raman process, if we have a, a, a blue pump photon, that comes and interacts with our system, we can have a red shifted Stokes photon emitted by the system. And, and in the process, we are imparting some energy to the phononic uh, degrees of freedom. So we're adding energy to the, to the, to, to the mode of interest. Um, whereas the other process that can happen is the anti-Stokes process, whereby a, 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 you know, a purple photon, uh, you know, a, a blue shifted photon comes out of the system, in which case we're actually extracting uh, energy from the system. So it turns out that if we use the same waveguide, turn up the pump power, we can literally cool the, the lower the effective temperature of the Bruan active phonon mode 
And in this way, we are manipulating the noise properties of this system in a way that's quite fun and, and perhaps quite useful. So, so these are the various a smattering of the sorts of things that we can do. And, and I've been very much surprised by, by what a rich playground there exists just with this seemingly simple three-wave interaction. So, um, so at the end of the day, hopefully I've you know, given you some reason to believe that, that there is potentially um, you know, a way to harness these interactions to do some, perform some interesting and perhaps useful functionalities in, in the context of integrated photonics. And, and the last thing I want to mention is I've been very selfish in talking about our research, but there's a lot of really exciting research that, um, that is in this growing field of integrated Bruin photonics from uh, groups at Caltech, from the Eggleton Group uh, in Sydney, from the Blumenthal Group at UCSB, who we've done a lot of collaboration with and have had a lot of fun. Um, so, and all of these different systems have a lot of intriguing properties that that are, that are um, I, I think, quite exciting and complimentary. So, so last but not least, I, 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 I should absolutely thank um, the, uh, the students and, and, our, and, and, and uh, collaborators that worked so hard and um, uh, diligently on this project, as well as our funding agencies. And, and I also want to thank you all for your attention. Any questions? Thank you for the nice talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, you could uh, create those acoustic waves uh, using piezo actuators rather than using uh, optical beams. Yeah. Can you, can you say a few words about it? You know, what are the dimensions of those piezo actuators? How do you arrange them along the waveguide? Yes, it's actually quite tricky. Um, so, so we, uh, so, so the, uh, so to emulate exactly what we're doing with the guided wave systems, ideally what we would like is a traveling last wave um, that, that moves along the waveguide. And uh, we can emulate that to, to, for example, to make this interband scattering process, what we, what we'd like is, uh, uh, a traveling wave, if this is our waveguide, we'd like the, the acoustic wave to be impinging on the waveguide from an, at an angle. And so what, one way to do that, and this is the way that Eric has illustrated in his um, recent paper in Nature Photonics, is you know, we'd have an uh, interdigitated electrodes that are, uh, that are not perpendicular to the waveguide, but have some angle with respect to the waveguide. Um, and and that, that is adequate to to mediate, to excite phonons with the right K vector and symmetry to, to make that scattering process occur. That said, there's a lot, if you want to have a very long interaction length for, for these types of scattering processes to and engineer the pass band, we really would like some more interesting and sophisticated transducer designs. And that's something we're working on, but, but it, it's, it, it, there's easily, easily a decade of work to do there. So, um, but, but does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but what are the dimensions of these uh, piezo transducers? Are they tens of nanometers? How far are they apart? Oh, yeah. so, so I, I think there are a lot of different designs. They can be, so I think, so um, you can have a transducer that is um, basically, I guess I might have, I might have some sketches. I think it, early on when I was showing you the surface acoustic wave uh, device at the very beginning. So let's see if I can do, I can't remember the shortcut. Okay, so here we go. Um, ah, so this is an example of a, of a classic transducer that has a, an array of IDT teeth. And these teeth would need to be on the order of microns uh, separated and maybe this for in one design that Eric has illustrated in his paper, um, the width of this transducer is about 100 microns or a couple hundred microns, and the teeth length, uh, so, so the length of these teeth is like a couple hundred microns, and the separation is on the order of microns. Um, so they don't, it doesn't need to be a lot of teeth involved in this to do the job. Um, but, but the layout and geometry is a, a very clever, you know, it's a part of the design that you really want to get 
um, optimized to, you know, maximize, you know, to reduce the footprint on this valuable, uh, on these valuable chips. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, for, for somebody not in the field, could you give us a brief like comparison um, between, uh, well, everything in your talk was about stimulated Brion scattering. Yes. You could also think about stimulated Raman scattering. Yes. What is, what is better in which case or what is, what is oh, beneficial? Oh, they're so, um, they're, I mean, so Raman is amazing, uh, but, but okay. So, so if you're thinking, are you thinking of integrated photonics or you think like, I'm trying to. I can. I can talk about these two different interactions at a high level, or we could go into the application. What, what would what would be the best application for for Brion versus Raman? So so Raman is wonderful because it. Um, so so Raman interactions are typically mediated by phonons at say 10 to 20 terahertz in in a lot of crystals and solids, um, and uh, and that's that's fantastic because you have a very low thermal occupancy for the phonons. That means you are gonna have very low noise. Um, you can get near quantum limited amplification out of a Raman amplifier, which is fantastic. Um, and Raman gain, uh, these resonances for Raman tend to be much broader, uh, which means you get a much wider gain bandwidth. So I should be clear that Bruon uh, interactions are not, uh, they're, they tend to be very narrow band um, because we are talking to phonons that are gigahertz frequencies, the occupation numbers, so the thermal occupancy, the number of phonons per mode tends to be closer to 1,000 or 500, which means that it is a noisier process. Um, uh, you know, uh, and so you can't get quantum limited amplification out of it. But if you're very clever in the way that you design certain things, you can uh, get basically negligible noise added if you're doing filtering and certain types of filters like notch filters you have a huge win it doesn't matter at all that it's a noisy process um, uh, but for an amplifier uh, you've got to be careful it can add noise it can add a fair bit of noise over quantum limit uh, so it depends what you're doing uh, but but the other thing that's interesting about brew on amplifiers is it does not add noise out of band so it depends what you're doing, and you really kind of have to be designing the system or the experiment and close to that um, to, to be sure, to, to understand the benefits and what could work. Um, uh, so I don't know, does that, does that help answer your, your yes. question? Thank yeah, you very okay. much. Yeah. Sure, sure. Any other questions? Thanks. Hi. Hello. Um, Hi. I've got a couple of questions. The The first one uh, to do with slide 19, okay. um, where you talk about the emitter receiver uh, device. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, have you guys looked into possible applications for non-invasive, uh, shall we say, um, <laughs> signal sampling? No, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I, that's interesting. I don't. I, I don't think we have, so, so you mean non-destructive or like non-demolition or what? Uh, a little bit of both. So non-destructive and non-invasive in that if you, if you have uh, some Bob and Alice uh, oh, sending oh. a signal over a, over a line, can you couple out of that line using this technique such that the, the output signal that they see as they would normally see isn't actually degraded at all? But do you end up because you've amplified the signal some using this this technique, you end up still being able to pull out a usable signal. Now, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, so we have thought a little bit about, I guess, I mean that, that's that's a very interesting question, and we have thought a little bit about the non-demolition nature of, um, but we haven't gotten that far. I have to be honest, but 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 yeah, I mean. Uh, I, I can't say that we've developed it. Uh, so, but yeah, if you'd like to chat more, that would be fun. That would be fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then uh, another two questions, sorry. Uh, sure. <laughs> there's many. Um, the second one was, uh, does this, this sort of forward uh, Brion scattering technique, does this, uh, how, how generalizable is it to other uh, 
other structures, other materials other than silicon? Because obviously everything oh. that you've shown us so far is in silicon. Yes, yes. Um, so, so it's so so I should be clear. So this forward gluon scattering interaction, I'm I'm of course trying to tell one story here, but but it is present in optical fibers. It's you can basically, I would roughly speaking, I would say that any material. Um, Every, so I'll just make a general, a few general statements. All materials have photoelastic response. Once in a while, you're unlucky, and one of their tensor coefficients vanishes. <laughs> that, that happens in sapphire. That happens in a couple of materials. It's very small in one, one of the tensor components in silicon. But you know, in general, you expect, I would say that in general, for a given material, you would expect that there, it is possible to make forward Bruin interactions, backward Bruin interactions. It's really just a question of strength. Um, and intermodal, all of these processes are quite general. The, the thing that, um, the thing that uh, is required for the forward gluon to occur that isn't, in, so in a bulk crystal, um, you can get um, backward gluon will always happen, uh, just a matter of the strength of those photoelastic coefficients and how, how large the interaction is. But forward gluon interactions are uniquely made possible by geometry of a waveguide structure. So meaning there have to be boundaries uh, on the structure. The reason why is because forward Bruan interactions really rely on a, a, a zero group velocity acoustic mode or a mode that's cut off. Um, and, and I don't know if you, if you know what I mean by that, but like in a metallic waveguide, if, if you go to, um, you know, there, there is a, 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 an, a, an, a microwave mode in a metallic waveguide that is essentially it becomes slower and slower and slower. And at some point, um, it becomes a standing wave. Uh, it's sort of zigzagging and bouncing between the boundaries. At some point, as you go closer and uh, lower and lower in frequency, it becomes a standing wave that isn't moving. It's a zero group velocity mode. So we're really utilizing modes to make forward ruan that are like that. And, and that's only possible if you've got a conduit for the sound. Um, so, so there has to be a zero group velocity mode or a mode that is um, that that has a has a, um, a a finite frequency at zero k vector. Uh, that that happens with that's only possible with geometry, not inside of a continuous bulk con, a bulk system with continuous you know symmetry. Gotcha. Thank you. And then yeah. one final quick question: uh, At O and R, what uh, code or program office are you guys working with oh, for this for this research? Right now, none. Uh, so, so yeah, I guess we were funded under timekeeping by, um, you know, Tommy Willis, but um, that was for more quantum -y stuff. And I didn't, sorry, I didn't get a chance to to talk about that. I I, I decided it was impossible to. I, I try. I was trying to jam it all in, but I couldn't fit it all in one talk. So um, I'd be happy to tell you about the other stuff we're doing with cold stuff that's sort of approaching quantum applications. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned early on was um, the force uh, radiation pressure force uh, distribution inside the fiber and also inside the silicon waveguide. Um, there are some fundamental questions about the um, momentum of light inside material media, like Minkowski, Abraham, yes. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yes. I think that question is best answered by looking at the distribution of electromagnetic force inside material media. Yes. There are different tensor form formulations that give you different force distributions, not total yes. force. But... Uh, the most interesting problem in that area is the force distribution inside magnetic materials, not oh. uh, dielectrics. Again, you mentioned um, magneto-optic effects, but you said those are hard to, to come by the materials. Um, what do you think is the possibility of creating some of these waveguides, whether in the form of fiber or uh, nanophotonic devices, using a transparent magnetic material like a crystalline garnet? and then uh, studying the force distribution, radiation pressure forces, and not the total force, but the distribution inside the waveguide. Uh, and then using um, uh, brilliant uh, techniques to monitor those, uh, uh, the effect of those force distributions. Ah, I see. I mean, well, you know, I mean, I think, I, yeah, it seems like it could be, so if, if basically what you're wondering is, hey, can, is, could Bruan be, uh, a way of 
yeah, so so I can tell you that we, uh, yes, Bruon scattering can be used to help dissect the force distribution inside of a structure. Um, if you if we if you have a good enough understanding of the elastic properties, so that's one of the things that we did in our earlier paper, like our our first experimental paper, we spent a lot of time thinking about that, and um, basically from the set of acoustic modes and the magnitude of the coupling. Um, produced by the light field, we could sort of surmise, not quite as good as tomography, but we could kind of surmise with pretty good confidence that we were correctly predicting with the basic models that we were using, the force distribution due to combination of photoelastic and, and um, radiation pressure forces. Um, but yeah, you're, you're asking a really interesting question. And I don't know, I, I don't know what, what um, intriguing things would come out of magnetic media. That would be really interesting to hear more about. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, are, uh, you're, are you, is, is it the um, sort of, uh, is it the mag, is it the magneto optic response that would, the strain dependence of the magneto optic response that, that would be giving rise to the forces that you're thinking of? Or is there uh, even an interesting radiation pressure component? It's an interesting radiation pressure component. It's the question of hidden momentum. Oh, um, Shockley's okay. uh, hidden momentum that is not present in the case of uh, electric dipoles, but huh. for magnetic dipoles, especially if they are spin related, uh, related to the spin as opposed to orbital magnetic moment of the material. Interesting. Then uh, that question of hidden momentum is closely tied to the distribution of electromagnetic forces. And it would be wow. nice to have a way to monitor uh, that uh, uh, photoacoustic or photoelastic uh, response of the material if the material is intrinsically magnetic. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I should I should caution that to to do okay. So, but it it may be possible um, to explore those forces in. I mean, I'm trying to think. Let's say you have a thin film, then maybe it's maybe it's possible that like with femtosecond, you know, ultrasonic, picosecond ultrasonics is what it's sometimes called in the literature. Um, it might be possible to think of using femtosecond pulses and to do ring down in order to measure and, under, and quantify these. This might be, that's a for, I mean, technically, if we're casting a very wide net for what is Bruon, you know, okay, picosecond ultrasonics, you could call Bruon, but, and, and, and there's some techniques there that might actually be useful to you um, if you're trying to dissect you know, uh, understand what is the forcing function produced by a thin film. I think it, it might be a taller order to make a very low loss waveguide, which is kind of what we're relying on here out of a novel material or something that's a little more exotic. Um, but I, I think, I think you'd, you'd have a good shot at getting some, you know, to an experimental proposal if you considered a thin film perhaps and, and would, are, are willing to expose it to like picosecond pulses to, to do experiments, uh, pump probe experiments, and, and look at the acoustic ring down spectra that are produced by those, you, you could probably back out. You've got a good chance, I think, of backing out the force distribution that way. That would be my thought for, for an easy, maybe a viable path forward. Okay, thank you. Sure. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so uh, on some level, you can describe the physics here uh, describing as the interaction between phonons and photons in a co-propagating phononic waveguide and optical waveguide. And my understanding is that you're, so you're creating a, uh, an acoustic wave in the phononic yeah. waveguide, and it has some coherence length, which yeah. I imagine is shorter than the actual length of the device. Much, in fact, much, yeah. Much shorter. So, but what happens when it becomes now comparable to the device? Say you go on a cryostat. Okay, so, yes, yes. So now that's a, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um, so, 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 okay. So, so there's, um, that's, that's a really interesting question. So that, that's something I forgot to emphasize, uh, right? That phonons have a much shorter coherence length. So typical in an optical fiber, you're, your phonon is at 10 gigahertz, and in these devices, the, the phonon, the, the attenuation length for the phonon is less than 100 microns. It's less than 100 microns if, if you're just going as the crow flies for a phonon that's moving in bulk medium. 
And then if we put it into a waveguide like the ones I'm showing here, where they're, they have rather slow bands, mm -hmm. we're talking about coherence lengths that are, in some cases, just tens of nanometers, if that, mm -hmm. um, which is a little peculiar. So they're essentially local excitations to a very good approximation in, in, these, in the structures I've been talking about for forward scattering interactions. And, um, but you're right, if, if, if we could cool them down and, and exploit really, and, and make their coherence lengths really long, um, then, then um, this, this locality, this approximation that, you know, if you open up Bob Boyd's book on nonlinear optics, he does, one of the first things he does is he takes these spatial wave equations and then he says, okay, we're gonna approximate, we're going to sort of neglect the spatial, we're going to treat the phonon field as local and, you know, truncate, simplify the spatial evolution of the phonon mode. Mm -hmm. um, but if, as soon as we start to have really long propagation distances for the phonon, then now this starts to behave more like a peculiar type of something more like parametric down conversion for light with three waves, mm -hmm. uh, where they all, all of the, the waves have a similar sort of, um, coherence, uh, the, the, their coherence lengths are uh, on a similar footing. Mm -hmm. um, but this has a really unusual property that the phase velocity, that the, that the velocities, um, the velocity of sound is way, way shorter than that of light. So there's some really strange sort of Robbie flopping sort of behaviors you can get out of so there. So there's a, it's a very interesting question. And there are a lot of peculiar dynamics that you can get mm -hmm. when you go into this I think you can explore a different type of strong coupling dynamics that are somewhere between what you expect in waveguides and some and, and optomechanics. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of it's a fun playground. So to get there would be really exciting. I mean, to what extent do you return to say the orthodox cavity optomechanics where you're talking about optical resonators coupled to mechanical resonators when you then sort of reflect off the opposite side of the waveguide and create essentially an, an acoustic a, resonator? It's a good question. Um, so you're, you're, you're close. You have many, many aspects that are similar. Um, uh, but the, 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 you, we now have, well, I guess, the, the beautiful and simple thing about cavity optomechanics is it's like a z when you write down the equations, it's zero dimensional, yeah. right? Um, so there's no spatial temporal dynamics when you've written down your when you've taken your overlap integrals between these discrete modes and you've mm -hmm. you've written it just as three modes a1 a2 and b or something like that yeah. um it, it's beautiful in cavity after mechanics but we have now with these traveling waves we have to reckon with spatial temporal dynamics mm -hmm. and the, the spatial temporal dynamics become simpler when it's when we can treat the phonon field as approximately local mm -hmm. um, as soon as it becomes non-local then we have a lot, you know, spatial temporal dynamics have a lot of things <laughs> that they can yield, um, and 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 it's very rich when you you're you've got a Green's function with two two arguments, space and time, rather than yeah. just space, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, just time. Um, so so I, I think there I think you're you're going to find my hunch is that you're going to find a lot of phenomena that are very much reminiscent of cavity optimal mechanics with some weird twists. Hmm. Um, so, but I, I I certainly can't produce a diagram of all of them. But we have, I have with some fun little theoretical explorations, you know, worked on questions of eh, related with some folks. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's some neat things there, but there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of peculiar properties that you, I think, I, 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 I suspect a lot of peculiar phenomena that hmm. if you pull on that thread, you could find. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Good question, thanks. If there are no further questions, I might ask, since we have a small audience here, and because Peter may have another five minutes, are there any sort of provocative side questions that anyone would like to ask? I, I have one. I mean, sure. So if you have all this rich physics, right? Yeah. Um, uh, to what extent are you making lemons, lemonade out of lemons? I mean, because I, you know, brilliant scattering, I imagine, was not the favorite discovery of no. people who invented, you know, fiber optics. Right. Uh, nor would it necessarily be the thing that you want uh, to have to deal with in a, a future world built on silicon photonics. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, I mean, it's a fair point. Um, you know, well, I guess the nice thing about 
So the difficult thing about, so the thing I would say about fiber optics is, you know, we, we use the, one of the most important, uh, there's so many important applications for fiber optics. Okay, let's be clear. Um, but, you know, for high power delivery, Bruon is a problem because it does this backward scattering that hinders your energy transport. For data, for when we weren't doing really wideband, you know, modulation formats, um, Bruon was a real pain in the neck because it would backscatter your signal and make things unstable, et cetera. Um, so I guess in silicon, I wouldn't say that we have necessarily that situation because um, backward Bruon is, is, is not, so it's, it's a nice situation in a way because only when you make effort to create this process does it exist in silicon. So, so we don't, you know, we really can't observe it unless we undercut the waveguides and intentionally make a conduit for sound. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's stifled. So, so it's kind of interesting. Um, it's probably quite good in a way that this, it has this peculiar photoelastic constant. Um, but I agree with you, you know, I mean, like, you know, it, it's, um, it's, you know, the, um, uh, so, so in, in a way, in, in silicon, um, it, it isn't a problem for, I think, the vast majority of, I, I don't think it, I, it seems unlikely to me that, it, that bru, parasitic bruon that is not, that is present because you didn't want it to be there, um, is likely to rear its head and be a problem in silicon photonics because yeah, we've had so such difficulty observing it otherwise. Okay. But we can engineer it. And when we do engineer it, it's always forward Bruon, which eliminates these problems of backscatter that have plagued fiber community. Um, so, so it might be a slightly different situation. Um, but, but, you know, I think your point about um, applications, you know, it, it's true. Uh, Bruon isn't, isn't, doesn't, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not awesome in all respects. Uh, it sounded so, awesome how you put it. <laughs> what, what's that? You made it sound pretty awesome. Oh, thanks. thanks. No, I mean, it's, a, it's, I think it's a really, I think it's a really exciting um, system to, you know, to explore device physics and, and to investigate different applications. But, um, but, you know, out of, out of sight of a few really, um, you know, niche applications with filtering, amplification, and, um, you know, signal processing, you know, we've got to get a handle on the noise properties. And I think if we, if we can, and I think there are some really neat ways to do that, then I think we could open up applicability even more than where it is. Uh, so that's, that's where we're sort of, what we're thinking about with classical signal processing these days is how, how to, how to um, engineer methods to improve the noise properties fundamentally of Bruon. But, okay. um, but I think that at the moment, I, I have to be, to be completely candid that the noise properties of Bruon are not favorable when you're doing amplification. And so we need to find really clever ways to totally change the game. And I think there are. Um, and and that's, that would be kind of fun. So that, that's one of the directions we're steering. But, um, but yeah, but otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting sort of applied physics optics playground until we get there, I think. But isolators, that, that, that's a place where oh, I can, whether you call it Bruon or Acousto optics, it's up to you. Oh, but um, those yeah. narrowband filters look very nice. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, another maybe stupid question, but um, what are some other potential sources of noise for you guys? Because you're, you're working at 13 gigahertz, is that right, for your, yeah. your phonon wave? Um, well, so. What, so yeah, we can, uh, by changing the waveguide dimension, we can tune it and we're between a gigahertz and, and yeah, 15 gigahertz, um, okay. but, but in that range, yeah. So what are potential sources of noise there uh, other than, you know, maybe the obvious ones? So, so, I mean, I think that the, the, at least when we're trying to make an amplifier, the biggest source of noise is, so I'll just compare with, um, uh, so, so I don't know if you know what difference frequency generation is in a nonlinear crystal. Is that, is that something that's familiar yeah. to you? Okay, yes, so, so this is, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, we can view Bruin interactions in a very similar light. And a lot of the wonderful papers from the very early 60s, you know, uh, if you read, if you really go read these 1963 papers, they're, they're, they're looking at Bruin in this, in this light, and it's, it's a very useful mental framework. Um, so, so, okay, 
so when you do, uh, if we do difference frequency generation, if we put in a pump photon, we get out to uh, lower energy photons. That's a process that makes amplification. Um, but normally, if we're doing that at optical frequencies, the, we got a signal photon and an idler that come away from a pump photon. Um, the, the idler, um, in the case of Bruon, is a phonon mode. Uh, and it's a phonon mode that has these interesting properties in this waveguide. But, but the, at fundamentally, at, at base level, when we do that difference frequency generation in optical domain, both of the you know, signal and idler photon modes that are participating are really have zero occupancy. They're just vacuum fluctuations. They have, this is the lowest noise you can kind of get um, in the optical domain. Uh, when we go to um, you know, lower frequencies, gigahertz, suddenly uh, you know, for these phonon modes, we have a lot of thermal phonons that are present. So what that tends to do is those, you can think of those as sort of inadvertently stimulating um, you know, signal photons where you don't want them to be there. Um, so, uh, so, so that if I have to say that's the biggest source of noise um, that that is an impediment to making low noise amplifiers and doing low noise signal processing. Um, in some there, I, there are some clever schemes where you can get around that noise, but not it's not universal for sure. Um, so, uh, so let's see. Um, but other sources of noise. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there are if you if you want to just talk about noise more generically in silicon photonics rather than noise processes that hinder hinder the Bruon interaction, um, there are a lot of interesting noise processes that are um, we need to learn more about and try to tackle. Some of them to do with um, uh, thermorefractive noise. Some of them to do with uh, um, you know, uh, I guess thermorefractive noise is the one that I've. I'm most familiar with as, a, as an issue, um, uh, but there are, but there are a few other types of fluctuating, um, a few other types of noise that where we can have fluctuating dielectric constants as a result of thermodynamic variables changing that do are very impactful to the stability that we can get out of resonators and 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 clocks in integrated photonics that are that are interesting beyond just thermal occupancy of phonon modes in, in Bruon. I don't know. I don't know if that's pointing you in the right direction, if that's helpful. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay, sure thing. Time for one more question, if there's any. No, I see shaking heads. Thank you very much, Peter. It was really wonderful. Yeah. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, normally I hand out a certificate, uh, but you're not here. So we'll send one, and, uh, and if you're ever here, we owe you a lunch and a dinner. <laughs> oh, wow. That would be fun. That'd be a lot of fun. Well, I want to say thank you very much for, for having me, and, uh, you know, I, I, I hopefully I can be in person soon. That would be awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you All very right. much. All right. Take care. Thanks, Thanks very much. So much. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you all. Thanks.